So today we're going to be learning how to build a ride sharing service, something like Uber or Lyft. Some basic requirements for something like this is the rider needs to be able to pick a point on a map and they need to be able to view the ETA and the price at that time. Once they're ready to call the ride, they need to be able to pay. The rider needs to be able to be matched to a driver, and then the driver needs to be able to accept the ride. And then finally, the rider needs to receive information about the driver, such as their type of their car, so that they can recognize them. And then the driver's location needs to be sent to the rider in real time. So taking a look at how we're going to structure a system like this, we of course need the drivers and the riders, and we need a database to store all of the information about them and the trips that they're making. And then taking a look at our requirements, there's some other services that we're going to need. First things first, we're going to need a map so that we can serve maps to the user. We're going to need a service that knows the ETA. So we need a ride service that can calculate the ETA and has information about the locations of every driver. We're going to need a pricing service, which is going to calculate the pricing based on load. The rider is going to need to pay for their ride. So we need a payment service and the drivers and riders need to be matched together. So we'll introduce a service that can handle that. Putting this all together, if each service was responsible for sending updates to every other service that needed information about it, this would be pretty difficult to do, and you can see just by the lines I'm drawing that this gets pretty messy. This tightly couples all of our systems. So for example, when a rider requests a ride, it would need to go out to the matching service to get matched to a driver, go out to the pricing service so the pricing service can update its price by load. It would need to update that in the database. And then when the driver approves, it would need to send that approval to the rider and to the ride service, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is pretty difficult to maintain. If you're enjoying this video, we have plenty more awesome data structure algorithm and system design explanations on interviewpen.com. You can ask us any questions you have about any kind of topics surrounding data structures and algorithms and system design. We release two to four videos a week. You can run your code. You can talk to a personalized AI teaching assistant. And yeah, the site's pretty great. Anyway, enjoy the video. So in order to solve these issues, we're going to introduce an event bus. The event bus can be implemented just with Kafka. And essentially what it's going to do is take information about our riders and our drivers and any real-time updates that they make. And then any service that needs access to that information can just subscribe to the event bus and get that data. So this makes things a lot cleaner and much easier to maintain as we're building out each of these systems. So now that we know what sort of problems we're solving and the high level structure of this system, let's take a look into each one of these issues and see how we can solve this problem. So first, let's take a look at our rider and our driver APIs. So a couple of things that we need to consider when we're building these out is we need to be able to handle a very large number of users accessing these APIs. There's gonna be a lot of users on our platform and each one of them is going to be making multiple requests to these APIs every single time they make a trip. So we need to be able to handle that load. To do that, we're going to introduce a load balancer in front of each of these APIs, and then we can horizontally distribute our API onto multiple nodes. The next thing to consider is that there's a lot of real-time data going on here. So for example, the driver needs to update the location and the rider needs to receive updates about that location location change in real time. So one option for this would of course be HTTP polling. So the rider could simply go out to our API, say every two seconds. And then once the driver updates the location, the rider would eventually receive that update. This introduces a couple of problems. The first one is there's latency on the rider's side. So the driver updates the location. We now have to wait two seconds for the next time the rider pulls the API in order to get that location update. And the other problem that's perhaps more important is that this introduces a huge amount of load on our rider API because now every single user that's using our app now has to pull this API every two seconds. We have to scale this API to be huge in order to ha handle that amount of load. So a much more scalable solution to this problem would be to use WebSockets. WebSockets enables our writer app to maintain a persistent connection with our API, and the API can actually push data back down to the app. This means that when the driver updates their location, for example, the writer can simply receive that update immediately by pushing the data to the app. So taking a look back at our high-level overview, we can see we've swapped out our API for our completed solution. So now let's take a look at the next piece of the puzzle, which is the database. So there's a few things that our database needs to hold. It needs to hold information about the driver and the rider so that they can see their own information and also information about each other once they've been matched. And we also need information about each trip. So drivers and riders will likely want to see their own trip history. And we need to be able to use this record in order to coordinate things like matching a driver to a rider or coordinating a pickup location. So for every user, we need a 
a phone number and a name, of course. And we'll also need an email and a password hash that we can use to identify the user when logging them in. For a rider, we'll of course need payment information so that they can quickly pay for their ride. And on the driver's side, we'll need the ride type. So for example, Uber has Uber X and Uber Black. So we need to be able to know which designation this driver is so we can specify the price. And we also need information about their car so that the rider can identify them. And then finally, we need the last known location of the driver so that when the rider opens the app, they can immediately see that last location on a map. Then for each trip, we need the rider ID and driver ID that that trip has been assigned to. We need the price and the location and destination of the trip, along with a date. We'll also need the ride type so we can assign the rider the correct driver. And we'll also want to include a status that says whether the drive is in progress, canceled, completed, waiting for a driver, etc. So I start here things that we'll need to query by. So of course, we'll, a driver will need to see its own information, and a rider will also need to be able to see its own information. Furthermore, for a trip, we'll want to be able to find the trips that are associated with a specific driver or a specific rider. We'll also want to be able to look up status, but only in the context of a specific driver or rider ID. So for example, a common query pattern would be, show me all of the in-progress trips associated with this driver. So let's take a look at how we'll actually structure our database given that information. It's important to note that this is going to be a very high traffic database. Drivers and riders are going to be constantly updating this data as their ride progresses. And furthermore, the driver is going to be sending frequent location updates that need to be persisted to the database every couple of seconds. So it's really important that we scale our database horizontally. And the easiest way to do that is with sharding. The way sharding works is essentially that we can split our data onto multiple nodes, and each node can hold a subset of the data. In order to determine which node our data is actually stored on, we can use a shard key. When you're looking for a shard key, it's important to have high cardinality and low frequency, and that allows the data to be efficiently split across multiple partitions. So for our trips and for our drivers and riders, we'll use ID, and since this is a unique identifier for the trip or driver or rider, this satisfies both of these requirements. Furthermore, this allows us to quickly look up a record by ID, because looking at the ID, we can immediately determine which of these nodes the data is on and look up the record very quickly. However, we still need to search for driver ID and rider ID on our trip. So in order to do that, we're going to introduce a global index. The global index is essentially just another sharded database where each record contains the ID that we're going to index on and a reference to the main table. So for these two global indexes, we'll have one that's sharded by driver ID and one that's sharded by rider ID. And then within each of these partitions, we can actually sort the data by the status and that will allow us to quickly look up by status. So to give an example, if we're looking for in progress trips with a specific driver ID, we can use that driver ID to immediately determine which node the data is stored on. And then since the data is sorted within that partition, we can then find the records with a specific status very quickly. Let's take a look back at our high level overview again. We can see that our database is now including our trips database, our rider database, and our driver database, along with the indexes that we need to efficiently access that data. Now taking a look at the next piece of the puzzle, we can look at the map and payments infrastructure and see how those will work. First, let's take a look at the map. There's a few key jobs that the map needs to perform. The first one is it of course needs to serve map images to the user. It needs to perform geocoding, which means it's converting a street address into a latitude and longitude. That will allow our users to actually look up a location that they're going to drive to without having to enter a specific latitude and longitude for that location. And we also need to be able to get directions and that'll allow our drivers to pick up our riders and know where to go. Now we could build our own map service. However, there's a bunch of other services out there that already do this, such as Mapbox and Google Maps. So we'll just use one of those for this example. Taking a look at our payments infrastructure, the rider of course needs to pay for their rides and the driver needs to get paid. And in order to do this, we could again, build our own payments infrastructure, or we could simply use one of many solutions out there, such as Stripe. If you're unfamiliar with Stripe, the way that it works is a user can push a payment to Stripe. And then once the payment finishes processing, Stripe will call a webhook that we set up. So in our situation, the user is going to pay for their ride, Stripe will send an update to this webhook, and then our webhook will add an event to our Kafka event queue so that we can continue processing the ride. So looking at this entire thing in context, we can see that we're using Mapbox for our map service, and we can see that Stripe and our webhook are then pushing information to our Kafka event bus. You'll notice that all of these services are attached to the client side of our rider and drivers, and that's because Stripe and Mapbox are both designed to interact directly with a client. For the map, of course, there's no authorization necessary because it's all it's doing is serving map tiles and looking up locations. And for Stripe, 
any processing that we'll do to make sure that the user paid the right amount, for example, will be done within this webhook. So the next problem we need to solve is the pricing model. So pricing for Uber, for example, varies by demand. They call this surge pricing at Uber. The way it works is essentially if there's higher demand in an area, for example, a concert just ended and 200 people are all trying to call an Uber from the same location, they're actually going to increase the price in order to take advantage of the higher demand. So in order to actually calculate price in this situation, we need information about demand. And processing every trip in batch would be far too slow for us. So let's take a look at how we can implement a streaming pipeline to make this actually work. So our price API, of course, needs to be able to get information about demand, and we're going to store that demand in a Redis in-memory database so we can access it very quickly. Then in order to to get the demand data into Redis, we're going to use Spark. Spark, if you're unfamiliar, is a distributed data analytics engine, and it essentially allows you to take in a data set and then perform various queries on it, such as filtering, sorting, aggregating, grouping, and joining things together. Um, if you've ever used the Pandas Python library, Spark is a lot like that, except that it allows jobs to be distributed across a bunch of workers. So the way we're going to use Spark is with a separate feature that it has called structured streaming. Structured streaming allows Spark to subscribe to a Kafka event bus, and then whenever it receives an event, it will process that in a streaming fashion and then push the resulting data to some other data source. So for our example, we'll have ride requests that are an event in our Kafka event bus. Spark will subscribe to those events, aggregate them based on time and location, and push them to this Redis database. So taking a look at our whole solution now, we can see that Spark is now subscribed to our Kafka event bus. We can see that our drivers can now access this price API to get access to the calculated price given the load. And our drivers can now access the pricing API, which will calculate the price based on load. So now let's finally take a look at the last piece, which is the rides and matching services. So for rides, there's a couple of very simple things that it needs to do. It needs to efficiently find drivers in a given area, and it needs to calculate the ETA. For the ETA, that's a pretty simple problem. We just need some sort of service that can make that calculation. We could either build our own service that takes into account demand and other characteristics about the driver, or we could simply use Mapbox or or Google Maps like we showed in the map service. For driver locations, however, this is an interesting problem. We don't know the exact location of the driver we're looking for. We only know that we want to find one that's in some radius of where the rider is. So we can't just index based on the exact location. We need some way to index off of an area. So to do that, we're going to use an algorithm that Uber developed called H3. And what H3 does is it splits the world into a bunch of hexagonal areas, and it assigns an ID to each one of these cells. Then it groups all of the drivers into these cells so we can efficiently look up a specific cell and all the drivers within it. There's a couple of interesting points about cell IDs. First one is that they can be calculated from longitude and latitude. So if I'm a rider here, I can see that I'm in cell D and I can efficiently look up that cell. Another interesting point is that one cell ID can be used to calculate adjacent cell IDs. So if I'm in cell D, I can look up all the other cells around it based on that. So if I'm a rider located here, I can simply look up all seven of these hexagons, then I can draw a circle around me, and I can find all of the rides that are within that radius. Then using the ETA service that we have here, we can look up the ETA for each one of those and find out which one is closest to us. Now taking a look at how we actually match a rider to a driver, we simply need to subscribe to the event that a rider requests a ride, and then once that happens, we can find the closest driver using our ride service that we just talked about. And then we need to tell the driver API to either accept or decline the ride. If they accept, we need to notify the rider who can then look up information about the driver and the driver needs to get directions to the pickup location. And if the request is declined, we need to simply repeat this whole process for the next closest driver. So taking a look at our entire system here, we can see that we have all of the parts completed. Let's just do another quick overview of everything that happens when we're using this system. Our driver is going to be able to use a map to find a specific location. They can then go out and they can find the price at that given location, and they can use this ride service to find the ETA. And then once they're ready, they can pay using Stripe, and then they can be matched to a driver using the matching service. All of this data will be persisted to this database to be looked up later, and real-time updates about the driver's location can be sent to the rider through this event bus. So this is a working solution, but there's a ton of ways that we can dig deeper 
and find better ways to optimize and make this whole system more efficient. So a couple of things that we didn't look into in this video, but you're certainly welcome to dig into yourself if you're curious. Um, first one is math. We didn't really do any math to see how much we need to scale all of our systems, um, but there's, there's certainly some numbers that can be crunched if you're curious about how this scales. We also didn't discuss redundancy, but that's a very important consideration. We need to make sure that if any one of these pieces fails, that our drivers and riders can continue riding, and that the rider can safely get to their destination in the event of any system failures. Some other interesting things to take a look at are algorithms for calculating an ETA. We mentioned that it would be possible to build our own ETA service that takes into account various other characteristics about a driver. So looking into the algorithms that services like Uber and Lyft use to actually do that, would be very interesting. Another thing that's really important for companies like Uber is data analytics. So having some sort of pipeline set up that can persist data to some sort of data warehouse and allow employees to analyze the data and make optimizations to the system is super important. We also talked about sharding our database of driver locations, but there's a lot of algorithms that can be used to make sure that the data is geographically located close to where the user is going to be requesting it from and that cells that are close to each other are actually located in nodes that are close Close to each other. And there's a ton of other ways that you can dig in and find different ways to optimize and make the solution better. And I certainly invite you to do so. If you enjoyed that video, you can get a lot more content just like this on interviewpen.com. We publish two to four videos a week. Really, it's just an arbitrary number. It's whenever I can sit down and do a video because these videos take a whole day to do. And we're always online to answer any questions you may have. Join our Discord, join our newsletter, The Blueprint, where you can get more weekly data structure and algorithm and system design kind of topics. And subscribe and like this video if you actually like this video and it helped you. And also tell a friend that we exist. That's all.